So welcome. Um, my name is Magda Terer, and I am the Schwedler Chair in Judaic Studies. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our last event of the year before our much needed break. Last year we have kept uh, going, last year we kept going over the whole summer, providing you with virtual programs from the earliest days of the pandemic. We did not stop, and, but we will be taking a break after today's event. I want to thank you all for joining us today and for joining us over the last long year. I want to thank my colleague, Professor Sarit Katan Gribitz, for her leadership this year, and Shavan Verletza for making sure that the programs became a reality. And I'm very grateful for the support of Forum University and its special events team who guided us through the new uh, virtual world from the beginning of the pandemic. These events, 34 since we went into lockdown in March last year, would not have been possible without the generosity of the Pickett Family Foundation, Mr. Eugene Schwedler, the Knapp Family Foundation, and so many of you. So I'm really grateful for your own generosity and for coming to our events throughout this whole period. Today's event features a very distinguished panel with Professor David Kurtzer of Brown University, Nina Valbusque of Ecole Francaise de Rome, and uh, Maria Chiara uh, Rioli of, of Car Foscari and also Fordham University, and David Gibson, who will be a co-moderator with me. On March 4th, 2019, Pope Francis announced the opening of the Pius XII archives. And on March 2nd, 2002, in the midst of the COVID pandemic, uh, the archives were finally opened after decades of scholarly curiosity about what they contained. These archives, which contain materials for, uh, from Eugenio Pacelli's pontificate from 1939 and, uh, to, until 1958, are of particular interest to those who study the history of the Holocaust, and the founding of the State of Israel, and the Catholic Church's involvement in both. Scholars and the public are eager to learn more about this pontificate, a complicated one that has led to what some call the pious wars, pious as P-I-U-S, on the one hand, he was described as Hitler's Pope. On the other hand, for some, a saint. And in 1945, just to give you a taste, Koppel Pinson remarked in his article on post-war antisemitism published in the journal Jewish Social Studies that, quote, we may agree or disagree with the general lines of the political policy of the Vatican, but this much is undisputed fact. Never has the papacy spoken in such unmistakable terms against racialism and antisemitism as in the words and deeds of the present Pope, Pius XII, and his predecessor, Pius XI. And then in 1975, in his address to the representatives of Jewish organizations, soon after the newly established Vatican Commission for the Religious Relations with the Jews, Pope John Paul II reiterated the repudiation of all forms of antisemitism and discrimination, as opposed to the very spirit of Christianity, he said, quoting the guidelines that were passed us that year, and which in any case, the dignity of human person alone would suffice to condemn. And he stressed also the repudiation in principle of all such violations of human rights whenever they may occur around the world. And then he, evo he evoked, um, he said, in your presence today, the dedicated and effective work of my predecessor, Pius XII, on behalf of the Jewish people. So as you can see just from that, the legacy is quite complicated. I want to thank uh, Maria Chiaradioli for spearheading this event as the Marie Skłodowska Curie Fellow here at Fordham University and David Gibson for inspiring us to have this panel on the topic on this topic and agreeing to join us. And of, all, of course, I want to thank our speakers for the willingness to share their insights about the archive of Pius the, the 12th and uh, you for, jo for joining us. Like many events at Fordham, this 
This event too is a uh, fruit of collaboration. It is co-hosted by Fordham University Center for Jewish Studies um, and Kafoskari University's Department of Asian and African uh, North African Studies and is co-sponsored by Fordham Center on Religion, Religion and Culture. And it, it, the event is also part of the RELNET project, Entangled Interfaith Identities and Relations from the Mediterranean to the United States, led by Dr. Maria Chiara Rioli. Uh, RELNET has received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program uh, under the Marie Skłodowska Curie Grant. Let me introduce briefly the distinguished panel, uh, and I will send the bios in the chat as well. Um, they are scholars of the history of, Jew of Catholic uh, Jewish relations, and I am happy that they will share their findings with us. Professor David Kurtzer is the Dupuy du University Professor of Social Science at Brown University. Uh, where he served also as provost from 2006 and uh, until 2011. Among his many books, which I'm sure many of you have read, uh, is The Kidnapping of Edgardo Mortara, which was a finalist for the National Book Award for nonfiction. And his uh, perhaps most pertinent to our topic today, The Pope and Mussolini, which won the Pulitzer Prize in biography in 2015. He was also elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Dr. Maria Chiara Rioli is the uh, Marie Skłodowska Curie Global Fellow at the Universities of Ca' Foscari in Ven Venice and at Fordham here in New York um, with the RELNET project I mentioned uh, above. Um, she was previously a manager of an Open Jerusalem project, and her publications include A Liminal Church, Refugees, Conversions, and Latin Diocese of Jerusalem, 1946 and 1956, which just came out last uh, year, and the book's introduction, I'll send a link to it as an open uh, source so you can click on it and get it. Uh, Dr. Nina Valbusquet is also uh, no stranger to Fordham. She's now a researcher at the Ecole Francaise in Rome, working on the Vatican diplomacy and Jewish organizations. Her first book was published in 2020, Catholic, Catholic et Antisemite, Le Réseau de Monsignor Benini, Rome, Europe, Etat Uni, United States, 1918-1934. She was a postdoctoral fellow at many uh, institutions, including the Center for Jewish History in New York, the United uh, States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and uh, here at Fordham as well. Um, her work has appeared in many journals, and I will not list them here, but I will send them to you in the uh, chat. And uh, finally, our co-moderator, David Gibson, who is the director of the Center of Religion and Culture at Fordham University, uh, where he came in 2017 after a long career as an award-winning religion journalist, author, and a filmmaker. Uh, David Gibson is the author of two books on Catholicism, the coming, uh, the coming Catholic Church, How the Faithful Are Shaping a New American Catholicism, and The Rule of Benedict, Pope Benedict XVI and his battle with the modern world. Uh, he co-wrote and co-produced several documentaries on Christianity for, this, for CNN and the History Channel, uh, and co-authored co co also a book on archaeology, biblical archaeology, Finding Jesus, Faith-Backed Forgery, uh, the basis of a popular CNN se series. So I invite you to submit um, your questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I'll now hand it over uh, for a brief moment to David to start us off. Well, hello, all. I um, thank you so much for that introduction, Magda. And um, I'm really happy to be co-moderating uh, this event. I think it's, um, I think we'd like to get a, just a brief sense from each of you. Uh, what has been the, um, uh, the, uh, the thrust of what you have been able to mine out of the archives so far in the um, in the time that you've been able to get in there. I mean, it's it's so fascinating to me that for one thing we had the uh, it was wonderful that the Pope has opened up these archives, 
But then we had the pandemic that severely limited what you could do. What has been uh, briefly the, the thrust of each of your um, work and how much have you been able to do given the limitations uh, uh, enforced by the pandemic? Uh, who should we start with, Nina Balbusque? Hi, hello everybody, um, and thank you very much. Um, yeah, so, I mean, because of the pandemic, of course, our access to the archives uh, has been limited. Uh, but I'm lucky enough to be in Rome uh, now since uh, last year, so I'm able to go to the archives frequently. Um, but just to give the audience a, a sense of uh, how, many, how many people can get there, actually now only 25 people researchers can access uh, the archives uh, each day. So it's an important limitation for our research. Uh, but I've been lucky enough to, to go to the archive um, since uh, September now, and uh, I'm looking specifically at the uh, relationship between uh, the Pope, uh, the Vatican, and Jewish organizations. I'm also looking at documents on uh, Vichy uh, France uh, and the persecution of the Jews. And then I'm looking at uh, documents on Jewish refugees uh, before the war, during the war and after the war, because one of the most important, um, I would say, uh, findings of uh, the archives are uh, especially about the post-war period. But I guess uh, we will talk about that in, uh, in the discussion then. Um, Maria Chiara, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, um, following what Nina was saying, uh, I think we, it's important also to highlight some methodological uh, changes that we all experience now um, accessing these new records, but in this new completely, completely new framework, uh, because we have all learned how pandemic uh, profoundly affects the way scholars carry out archival research. Uh, how we correspond with archivists, uh, how we peruse inventories, catalogs, we access to boxes for a limited period of time in totally unexpected conditions, and uh, we browse digital collections. So, of course, the physical and digital uh, investigations are very different kinds of uh, experiences, and sometimes it's mutually confounding. And we find all these elements also navigating through the Pius XII papers, uh, so, for example, in the um, archives of the section for relations with the states uh, of the Vatican Secretary of State, uh, the documents are accessible in their digital format, even in the physical reading room. And another example is the Vatican uh, Apostolic Archive, when we deal with different difference between the consultation on the printing and the digital inventories in the reading room. Uh, so, of course, we, we experience a sort of uh, an expansion in a time of re restriction, the digital and the in-person capacities of the archives uh, because we apply to digital digitalization of documents and at the same time of course these conditions affect especially uh, early career um, researchers uh, who live far from Rome for example and um, in, my case, in my case for example um, or for many of us um, attending this uh, event. Um, I'm working now on, especially on documents um, in Jerusalem, so the Apostolic Delegation of Jerusalem and Palestine, and the archives of the Congregation uh, for the Oriental Churches on the role of the um, Vatican and the Jerusalem Church during the uh, war um, for Palestine and during the 50s. But yeah, we will talk more about that. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, David Kurtzer, uh, what's your what's your access been to, through the through this pandemic? Yes, well, it has been a, a problem for those of us who aren't lucky enough to be uh, in in Rome. I was there uh, and planned to be there. I had reservations for five months, beginning March second of uh, last year, the day they opened. And, uh, but after my first week there, uh, not only did they announce uh, rather dramatically in the archives that Friday that they were going to be closed uh, and not open until further notice. But then a few days later, the uh, prime minister, then Conte, announced a lockdown where you weren't supposed to leave your apartment till further notice. And so we, um, my wife and I, gave up our five-month uh, rental in, in Rome and uh, returned to the U.S. 
Um, fortunately, they reopened the archives in June, albeit as uh, was mentioned uh, with more limited access. And fortunately too, I collaborate in my research with a Roman-based uh, Italian scholar, Roberto Benedetti, who has been able to continue to work there uh, more or less daily since last June and uh, share materials with, with me as we work together. Um, I'm working on a follow-up to my book that was mentioned earlier, uh, Pope Mussolini, which dealt with Pius XI and his relationship with the Italian fascist regime in the 20s and 30s. And uh, this follow-up book deals with his successor, the controversial Pius XII, whom we'll be talking about, and his relationship with Mussolini and Hitler uh, during World War II. Um, I should mention that in addition to, uh, first of all, they're, they're different, as was alluded to, different Vatican archives, uh, including the, uh, what used to be called the Vatican Secret Archive, now the Vatican Apostolic Archive, the archive of the Secretary of State uh, section on relations with other states, uh, the Inquisition, uh, the former Inquisition Archive, the Archive of the Congregation, the Doctrine of the Faith. And then in January, the Jesuit Archives, Central Archives, which are just outside the uh, walls of the Vatican, open to researchers. That's another, uh, depending on your, your topic, but certainly for me, an important um, place for finding documents. Uh, and then just the last thing I'd mention is that those of us who are working on more political kinds of questions, uh, for us, it's not just the Vatican archives that are important, but a series of other political archives, whether you know, Italian state archives and foreign ministry archives and secret police archives, uh, but also uh, French, British, German, and American, Brit uh, and other uh, diplomatic archives of the uh, each of which had an envoy or ambassador in the Holy See throughout World War II. When uh, these are most, aside from the state archives, the ones that you listed are archives, I know very well. Um, I am wondering whether the announcement and then the opening of the archives changed your own uh, plans for research uh, and what are you as a result in the context of the projects that you mentioned, what are you trying to find in the new, newly, hopefully more fully accessible um, uh, resources? Well, I guess I'll... I'll sure, just... and then... <laughs> um, the... Uh... I, as I mentioned, I mean, I think it, from my point of view, it's given my interest in the political situation, it's triangulating different archives, the different Vatican archives, other ecclesiastical archives, along with the various uh, diplomatic archives in various countries, uh, along with military intelligence reports and these kinds of things that you find in various other archives. Um, in terms of what the Vatican archives themselves will tell us that we don't know, I mean, there, there are a couple of issues there. One is, uh, it's been mentioned that, um, the Vatican, and given the controversy over the Pope's behavior during the Second World War, had a group of Vatican Jesuit scholars um, put together, they say 11, uh, physically 12 volumes, uh, thick volumes of uh, documents, hundreds and hundreds, thousands of documents from World War II period. Uh, and those were published between 1965 and 1981. Uh, so we've already had quite a lot of Vatican materials from World War II available. Uh, so one of the things scholars have been waiting to know is uh, how were they selected? And do they represent the, uh, the full set of the most important documents uh, dealing with this fraught history? Or were they were certain kinds of more embarrassing to the Vatican documents uh, filtered out? So that's one of the things I've been looking at. Um, but uh, you know, there are many other questions I would say um, looking at the kind of internal debates within the Vatican, uh, kind of side comments that never became public insofar as they can be found on internal memoranda in the archives. This too is very important as I'm sure my colleagues can also demonstrate. Yeah, if I can follow up on, on David and, and illustrate actually <laughs> what he, he just said. Uh, so we know already a lot about the diplomatic uh, correspondence between uh, the Vatican and other states because of the Acte Document du Saint-Siège. So these are like 11, as you said, 12 volumes. But this is only a, a, a selection of documents. And um, so if I can share my screen now. Um, 
Here we are. Let me show you. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, the, the Vatican's uh, Vatican documents are interesting because we can really do a sort of global history. You know, documents are coming from all over the world and from all the diplomatic uh, representations of the Vatican in, in different uh, places. And here I'm just showing you some of them, but I'm also working on Latin America, for instance, for, for refugees. Uh, but what I wanted to show mostly is that uh, now in the, the Vatican archives, you can see different versions of the same uh, document, of the same letter, and you can see the draft. So this is, for instance, a letter that we knew, and it's um, basically the nuncio in Vichy who is commenting on the roundup of Jews in Paris uh, in July 42. And so that's the original letter with his, his uh, signature. And here you can see a draft, for instance, of that the same letter. So you can see all the changes, all the modifications of the things that were canceled. Um, here you can see uh, already, um, yeah, the, the changes. This is another draft, another letter in October 42, also about Vichy. Uh, and this is another uh, example of draft, this time from uh, for, uh, 39. And um, yeah, here talking about uh, refugees and some uh, of Jewish race. Um, but you can see these different levels of writing and handwriting, which could give us uh, some headaches sometimes. So that's why we spend so much time in the archives, actually. So this is just to give a, a sense of uh, uh, what the documents uh, actually uh, look like. And sometimes you can see also a comment about the outcome of uh, a letter. Um, This actually yeah. look very familiar to what I know from the early period of Maria Chiara. Yes, I'm um, just recalling what David and Nina um, were saying. Uh, so, of course, we deal with the diversity and plurality of our archives. Sometimes we think the Pais the 12 archives are a specific building. No, there's really um, different institutions with different rules of access and conditions of work and different kind of collections. So, um, for my current research, um, and I, yeah, I can show you um, some documents um, sharing the screen. Um, so as I was saying, um, I'm working on um, the, can you see? Um, yeah. Sorry. Um, Yes, yeah, just for example, if we move uh, for a moment our observation to, to Jerusalem and we focus uh, on the attention to the Catholic Church and its relation with the Jews, because uh, our talk also relates to that. Sorry, um, I'm just, it's just, uh, yeah, this point. Um, we have some different archives which are particularly interesting for that. And uh, of course, the, the, the Vatican Apostolic Archive, but also uh, the Secret of Vatican uh, um, Secretary uh, of State. And for example, this letter is taken from uh, um, this archive. And uh, so it's a letter um, uh, sent in July 1947 uh, from the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem to Pius XII. And uh, it just give, you, give us some sense of the importance of these archives concerning also the debate uh, uh, about Jerusalem and Palestine in the post-war period, as um, Nina was saying, the importance of the archives, um, particularly in the post-war period. And, um, and also um, concerning uh, uh, the Palestine war and the 1948 war, we have very important and um, very interesting documents in the archives of the congregation for their oriental churches, and just give you the sense of some folders and uh, for, on, for example, on the refugees, in this case, on the Palestinian refugees, the humanitarian action uh, of the church in this case, and uh, for example, the Catholic Near East Welfare Association. And this is interesting because, for example, we, we find documents um, which we can find in different versions in New York, uh, because the archives of the Catholic Near East Welfare Association is now in the uh, archives, or gathered in the archives of the New York uh, uh, Archdiocese. Uh, so just to documents recall are their documents and maybe I will show you later some other um, of these um, crossing and entanglements of documents. 
If I could just uh, follow up real quickly on this a question of the sort of confidence that you're having access. I was struck by um, uh, Pope Francis's uh, remark when he oh, announced the opening of the archive. He said, the church is not afraid of history. Uh, and which seems like a rather generous reading of the, um, of the church's approach to history uh, in the past. Um, I do wonder if in this, even with this limited pandemic access, is there, is there also a sense apart from access to the actual archives, is there a sense of a change of attitude under the Francis pontificate and in this time? Uh, do you feel as though you're welcomed into the archives? I mean, David, you've been doing a lot of very spiky <laughs> uh, stuff here. I mean, do you, do you feel that you're being welcomed there, that you are given the access, that there's a change of attitude somehow? Um, yeah, that's not an easy question, really. The, um, I mean, I think there hasn't been a, a unidirectional flow here um, in terms of attitudes about openness to this history. It's still a very fraught history for the church. And now talking about World War II and the whole controversy over the silence of Vice the Twelfth during the Holocaust. Um, I mean, one indication that for me was kind of depressing was that um, I published a piece last uh, August um, it was one of the first pieces, I think, to come out of the newly opened archives, looking primarily at the immediate post-war period and uh, like kind of inf infamous or famous case of uh, the Finley brothers, these two young Jewish children who had been, um, whose parents had been murdered at Auschwitz and had uh, been saved by a Catholic woman and then ended up in Catholic institutions. And when the uh, relatives, the uh, siblings of the parents who survived the war tried to reclaim them, uh, the, they were hidden away. And uh, one of the things we discovered in the newly opened archives is that the uh, Secretary of State, and the, uh, the Holy Office and the Pope all were, were directly involved in giving advice to um, keep these children away from their family, Jewish family, if at all possible. Uh, so uh, just a week after my article appeared in the Atlantic, the uh, uh, Vatican daily newspaper, Zorotoi Romano, uh, devoted a full page to essentially denouncing me, my work, and my piece. Um, yeah, I found that not a good sign in terms of today, the Vatican being willing to confront this history. So uh, I mean, there's a, a longer response I could give, but that's certainly one rather disturbing symbol. I will say that when I am in the Vatican archive, uh, occasionally one of the archivists you know, who in some cases are, are clergy um, will come and kind of whisper in my ear that they've read something I, I've uh, written and, and liked it and hand me you know, their own off print. Uh, so even, so it's not a, a cl clearly there are different uh, divisions or factions, if you want to call them that at the Vatican uh, who have very different attitudes. Uh, Maria, yeah, what, what have you found? Yeah, of course, uh, I do agree with David. Uh, um, so this kind of tension, of different, um, I mean, it's, it, it's a historical basis, of course. And at the same time, we can also highlight uh, the history of this opening is part and parcel of this complexity. And um, in October uh, 2019, um, Pope Francis removed the adjective secret from the title of the now apostolic, um, apostolic Vatican archive. So this is an important step at the same time. But of course, um, on the same day, we all remember uh, David and Nina, on the same day of the opening, March 2nd, uh, 2020, there were um, polemics, I mean, tension on, on that uh, concerning uh, the truth behind these archives. So um, this long history affects uh, how we deal with uh, documents now, but at the same time, uh, I think that now the opening of these collections could inaugurate a new season uh, characterized by the search of source-based and accurate appraisal of the history of the pontificate. And at the same time, it's also evident that the full scope of what the archives reveal um, will emerge after years of uh, study. Uh, but the documentation is already opening up, as David was showing, new questions or reframing uh, hypotheses and challenging former identifications. Nina, what, what, what is your sense of the attitude? Yes, I, I, I want to stress that um, uh, actually uh, how uh, professional 
is uh, the environment in the Vatican archives. It's very, uh, I think it's very actually welcoming and, and archivists and, and staff are uh, again, very professional and very helpful. Of course, you have to spend a lot of time there and you know, to, be, uh, to become familiar with the different uh, collections. And that's the, I would say the, the difficulty is mainly to find your way into uh, the archives because it's very huge. Um, but I would say that I'm, so yeah, in the archive, like, uh, as I said, it's, it's very helpful and professional, but I'm mostly concerned about apologetic tendencies uh, that David mentioned, for instance. So, and we have, I mean, it's, there is a persistence and even a revival of that apologetic tendency that obviously aims to uh, the canonization of Pius XII and focuses only on rescue um, of Jews and doesn't seem to want to see the, the broader picture and all the other facets and aspects of uh, that question. So I would say that um, Francis, Pope Francis' declaration on uh, the church is not afraid of history is an important uh, step. And it's of course in the continuity of uh, the Second Vatican Council but unfortunately within the church, there are other tendencies that are much more reactionary. And, and I think we'll take the occasion of the opening of the archives to advocate for uh, the canonization of Pius XII. And so it's not the end of the Pius wars, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I think the complicating factor is the canonization as well. I just wanna make a comment, two comments. One is on, on the general access, my experience, and I'm not working on the uh, on the recent history, but no, no less controversial aspects are in the archives. But the advantage is that people don't know what's in those volumes from the 17th and 18th century anymore. Uh, so, so generally, if you are familiar with the structure of the archive, you can get the documents that you are hoping to examine in this way. Um, but the other thing is, I think, um, you know, the idea, and David, you mentioned that there is no one church, right? There is, there's the ideal of one church, but in fact, there are so many, A, the members of the church uh, are, you know, billions. And the other thing is the official hierarchy. And even that is not one in speaking with one voice. Um, even in, in you know, countries like uh, Poland that I am familiar with, you also have different voices. And I think some, um, some members of the church hierarchy will agree with Pope Francis that the church is not afraid of history, but some will be very much still afraid to look into that, uh, that past. So I think it's that struggle. And I, as all of you are sh talking about is that empirical, work that slow empirical war work that shows the you know how the the church works with the documentations that have been um preserved might might help if i can just pick up on that uh, magda i mean you talked about that slow empirical work and the framing in the same time as nina you said the pious wars <laughs> continue and in that kind of this battle between Pius, St. Pius XII, as some want, and Hitler's Pope, as some others want to see. There's also an expectation, I think, of a smoking gun, to that one of you will discover some smoking gun document or something that will definitively prove he was Hitler's Pope or that he's a saint. Uh, is there, can we expect any kind of huge surprise coming out of these archives now? Or do you think this is really kind of a long, a long game of classic historical research? David, do you want to? Uh, yes, well, um, no, I don't think there's gonna be one smoking gun that's going to, I, in fact, I, I despair of any evidence actually changing people's minds these days. Uh, but uh, given some of the you know absolutely outrageous things that are are said that um, uh, that are already we know are clearly wrong. I mean, the, in the month before the opening of the archives, uh, as was, was mentioned, there were already um, 
kind of preemptive strikes on behalf of the defenders of Pius XII, uh, including, for example, a full page big piece in one of the major time papers saying that um, Mussolini struggled mightily against the appointment of uh, Pacelli or the election of Pacelli as Pope, uh, which we know from the uh, diplomatic Italian diplomatic archives is totally false that actually the uh, Italian ambassador was working to have Pacelli elected Pope as was the German ambassador. So uh, one as scholars, I think we begin to despair sometimes that, that evidence is gonna make much difference to, uh, to at least the public uh, debate. Um, that said, I think you know, there were those who, who, who said that with the publication of the 11 or 12 volumes of uh, hundreds of documents, we weren't going to find anything very much new. And I think that, that we now know is wrong, that in fact, a lot new is going to come to light. We'll have a much richer idea of what was going on than we did before, but uh, with, even without any particular smoking gun. Nina, what do you, uh, Nina or Miara, uh, Mario, do you think, do you expect uh, anything? Uh, I agree with David, actually. I'm not expecting any uh, well, smoking gun, uh, neither, but... Um... Um, what we can find in the archive in the archives are, are more details, so we can have a more complex, nuanced, and uh, granular picture of actually uh, what happened. Um, so, if I can share uh, my screen again, I will show you some other. Um, let me see. Is that, okay. Um, what we can find in the archives are, are um, actually the kind of internal debates uh, within uh, the Vatican uh, authority and between different collaborators of the Pope. Um, so you can find different comments here. It's uh, on the letter of September 1939 and you have a comment uh, by Domenico Tardini, who is the um, substitute of the Secretary of State uh, for, let's say, international uh, relations. And he said, here is written, um, this letter is not very diplomatic. So you, know, you can see what's the point of view of one of the officials in the Vatican on that uh, draft letter, for instance. Um, here you, you have another report uh, by the Lacqua and you have a comment on, on, on the, in the margin would say verissimo, it's very true. Um, yeah, so you can really, you can see this type of, uh, of small comments in the margin, but they actually give us a lot because they give us, they give us more complexity about different, um, different opinions within the Vatican. Um, and uh, also not only be, uh, within the Vatican, but also between the different nuncios, between the different Vatican diplomats in uh, different countries. And I think that's what, what is actually most interesting for me for my research now is to see uh, about like different attitudes of, um, of nuncios. For instance, the one in Switzerland, Monsignor Bernardini, was much more uh, willing to help um, Jews and to, um, uh, forward information about the Holocaust to the Vatican, while the nuncio in Vichy, for instance, was uh, much more uh, reluctant to do so. So here we can see different, um, um, different opinions, different uh, attitudes, and I think this is very important because now with the Vatican archives, we can really hopefully shift the focus away from the personality of the Pope and really get the broader and much more complex picture. Yes, I, I, I totally agree, of course. And uh, we can remind also that on the base of the Acte Document, or, although the criteria of the selection are not explicit and not uh, fully clear, but on the basis of these documents, we already have a solid historiography and um, scrupulous analysis, for example, we can quote the work by Giovanni Miccoli, The Dilemma and Silences of Pius XII, which appeared in its first edition in 2000. So um, now with these new documents, we can try to reemerge from an awful, um, painful, uh, polarized debate. And um, so no um, specific weapons, because as historians, we don't need uh, these kind of um, concepts. But um, 
a more nuanced description, of course, and a new way to understand um, documents we already know, for example, or documents located in our in other contexts. Um, I can show you some other documents. Uh, for example, um, this um, catechism, uh, it's a digitization from a, a book uh, which is called Or uh, from the New York Public Library. Um, to understand this document, I, I needed um, the Vatican archives of Pius XII uh, because the correspondence between the author, um, Jean-Marie Paul Boucher, and the secretary um, of the Congregation for the Oriental Churches, Jean Tisserand, is located in the archive of, of the Congregation for the Oriental Church. And this catechism is interesting because it's, a, it's really a fascinating source. It's a 360-page uh, catechism in Hebrew. Uh, printed in 1945, so what uh, year uh, in Jerusalem by the Franciscan printing press. So different archives um, trusting each other, and um, we need all of them. And, and again, to, um, to rewrite, to write a new um, entangled history of the pontificate, we need to not to focus uniquely on the Vatican archives. And uh, this is important also to historicize uh, these archives and the work we are doing in these archives. So I have a, a sort of a follow up. I also found that m once you engage in this archival research, most of the documents are quite boring. Uh, it's just a tedious kind of work. I remember when I was going into my, my project on Jews and the Catholic Church in early modern Poland, everybody was so um, hyper uh, opinionated about what were the Jewish Catholic relations in pre-modern Poland. And so I was expecting a lot of exciting stuff in the archives, but the majority of it was quite dull and boring. That said, I am wondering, even though you're at this very early stage that is that has been much uh, complicated by COVID and access, whether you have already found something that surprised you or that made your heart go a little faster. Uh, and if you could share uh, share that, or if you didn't, um, that's interesting. Well, I would, uh, one thing I'd say is that uh, so on the one hand, uh, we often hear there are tens of millions of pieces of paper in these newly opened archives the Vatican, not to mention other ecclesiastical archives that are, are opening. And so it will take you know, 10 years before anybody can say anything useful uh, about this history. It's um, often it seems to be uh, people eager to defend the reputation of Pius XII who say this. And I find it a little ironic because a number of those same people have already written uh, biographies of Pius XII, uh, even without the opening of these archives. So. Uh, but I think what this doesn't recognize that, although it's very true, as Nina mentioned, that there's just a huge amount of material. There are all these finding aids. There's not a single um, unified uh, uh, catalog of the documents. But what the, uh, and this is very important, what the Vatican archivists have done over many years before the actual opening was prepare finding aids uh, to these various uh, categories of sources. So that, for example, uh, the, the uh, nuncio, various nuncios were mentioned, you can go to the nunc Pat Nuncio's uh, archive and have, in many cases, a quite detailed list of the documents that are, that are found in there. And that certainly make uh, uh, our lives uh, somewhat easier. Uh, that said, you're, it's certainly true, as you mentioned, a lot of the documents are uh, rather boring ones. And in fact, when they say, we're not gonna know anything for years because there are 30 million pages of documents, a lot of these are, you know, somebody asking for a pair of shoes or uh, having to do with the appointment of a bishop in um, Bolivia or something. So um, we don't have to read through the 30 million pages in order to say something on topics of, of interest to us. Maria Chiara? Yes, um, I was thinking about the first week that uh, David also um, remembered uh, the first week of the opening 
uh, with Nina, we were in, this, in the Vatican Apostolic Archive and we were dealing with the same dossier. So there were some, during the, the same days, uh, she was reserving the, the file, then I reserved it, and then, then we were moving. So of course, uh, we, we feel sometimes through the inventories, through very short description that in some files, there could be interesting documents. And sometimes we, we're, we do find the, um, um, interesting, fascinating, and opening new um, hypothesis documents. I presented some documents uh, in my book, that, um, and for me, it was uh, really um, important to um, cross before, to consult before, to profoundly navigate before um, archives located outside the Vatican and to uh, refine, for example, the minutes or uh, the final version of documents uh, in the newly released by the 12 hour papers. So this mm, me really mechanism of um, the, the system of the correspondence between uh, different actors uh, that you really feel when while entering these uh, archives is, um, is really important for the historian to understand. Um, yeah, and the humanitarian machine of the Catholic Church also after the the, the war, it's uh, I think it's a really new topic that we need to um, go to deepen through the following years. Can I can I pick up on that, Maria? Uh, and which kind of interested me, and your article in the Atlantic, David, on the finale, finale brothers. Um, how much you know? There's so much focus on the wartime pope. And this, these archives also, if I understand it, cover the post-war era. I mean, the, the, the pious pontificate went on to 1958. How much are we going to learn from this post-war period, which you know, evidences so many uh, episodes like the Finale Brothers uh, that you wrote about, David, which is rather horrifying when you look at it, but also the people involved here, Giovanni Battista Montini, Domenica Tardini, these are men who also laid the groundwork for Vatican II and Nostra Aetate, came out of the same <laughs> pontificate. How much are we going to learn from the post-war archives that, you know, while we've been focusing so much on the, on the wartime archives? Well, in fact, I think there is a case to be made for uh, that we'll learn more new about the post-war period than we will about the war period, just because a lot of those documents, uh, a lot of important documents were already published, whereas for the post-war period, they haven't been. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, post-war period is a very dramatic time. I mean, if you think just of Italy, uh, it's been largely destroyed by the war. Uh, the Vatican fears that the communists are going to come to power, and uh, they almost do. Uh, the Pope is very active in, um, in anti-communist activity and in organizing the, Democratic, uh, the Christian Democratic Party has conflict with uh, De Gasperi, who's the head of that party that has not yet entirely come to, to light. Um, and then there's the whole Cold War. It's the Pope, it's Pope till 1958. And so this, the opening covers materials up through uh, to 1958 and his death. So, uh, and then for the, the Jewish uh, relations question, this is an important time as you mentioned, Leading up, I mean, part of the reason that Pius XII uh, has such staunch defenders is uh, there are those in the church who think that it's at the Second Vatican Council that the church went wrong, and Pius XII is the last pre-Second Vatican Council pope. In fact, if you ever ch check Twitter, which maybe you shouldn't, and um, put in Pius XII on any given day, you'll see all sorts of tweets saying he was the last pope, that after Pius XII, all the popes were for some reason illegitimate. Um, so looking at the attitude toward Jews and, and what could have led uh, Roncalli, John the 23rd, and, and uh, Tardini, who became his Secretary of State, to, um, to start this uh, movement to radically change the attitude of the church toward Jews, um, I think that there, we will learn quite a lot there, too. Yes, if I can... Uh... Uh, champion and also answer uh, Max, Magda uh, question from before. Uh, I would say like the most surprising uh, findings for me um, now have been uh, about the post-war period. Uh, and we will find a lot because it's until um, 58, but just if we look at the years, you know, 
45 until let's say 48, uh, until the creation of the state of Israel, already we can find a lot about um, the church um, say interpretation, first interpretation of the Holocaust, for instance. Um, and so I will say that I was mostly shocked about uh, the lack of awareness of what actually happened during the Holocaust uh, in, the, in the immediate post-war period. So um, I found like Vatican officials really did, did not address uh, what was the what was the Holocaust and its impact? Um, so, and I will take two examples of that. Um, in uh, July '46, um, the French ambassador to the Holy See, Jacques Maritain, uh, who is a famous um, Catholic intellectual, uh, wrote to the Pope and said that the circumstances have they have changed. You know, Nazism has been defeated. So it's time to denounce anti-Semitism, to speak out against, against anti-Semitism. And he's referring to the Kiel's program uh, in, in Poland. Um, and now in the Vatican archive, we can actually find the, the answers of uh, the Vatican officials to that request by Maritain. And they basically saying, um, no, we cannot, because of geopolitical reasons with the creation, I mean, with the, the fear of the creation of the state of Israel, with, to which the, the church is very opposed. Uh, but also the comments say uh, also because of Jewish revenge, like we can see now Jews are not behaving well. You know, so it's, it's very shocking to see that kind of uh, comment in 46. And another document that I found is also 46 and it's uh, Monsignor de Lacroix um, with a, an official within the uh, the Vatican, and he's talking about DPs and Jewish refugee, refugees who are trying from Italy to go to Palestine. And some of them, um, they can actually, they cannot leave uh, the port of Las, La, Las Piazza in, in Tuscany. And so they, they started a um, hunger strike, right? And so the Lacroix is commenting on, on that protest from Jewish refugees and he's saying in 46, he's saying, uh, I don't believe that um, the hunger strike, we, strike will, will last very long because Jews uh, don't like to suffer and they're not used to suffering. So we're in 40, 46. So we can see like there is no awareness of actually what happened. And that's, it's not the full picture, obviously that's, uh, you know, but we have to keep that in mind. And I, I guess we will discover more about in, in that uh, direction. Yeah, um, to continue what you and David are saying, of course, the archives will shed light and are already shedding light on the, on the Cold War, uh, the early phases of the process of decolonization, uh, the formation of the United Nations system. So it's, it's really a mine for different kinds of topics. And concerning uh, Jewish Catholic relations, of course, they, um, they unpack the role and the, the personalities of um, different figures. But at the same time, I think that um, we have the voices of um, more silent actors and from the periphery, because we, we also uh, read the, the correspondence in entrance. I mean, what they received in Rome. And through this way, we, for example, concerning Israel, we find documents uh, um, from the communities um, the new communities of Jewish converts to Christianity, aiming at um, trying to find a new way to um, to live in Israel as Catholics, and also to, in a later phase during the 50s, to establish new relations between uh, the state of Israel and the Holy See. Uh, so these instances from the periphery, I guess I, I would say, and at the same time the resistance in Rome um, or on the other side, the figures that try to, in some ways to give voices to these new narratives and the review of the attitude of the church to the Jews, all these elements complicate the picture, but of course give us a more nuanced sense of what was happening. I'm struck by the, um, uh, what you're saying about the, the, the wider frame here. I was uh, remembering Hans Kung, the great Swiss theologian recently died. Years ago, I, I did an interview with him 
And uh, I asked him about Pius XII. He had the, the best story when he was a seminarian, Hans Kung, the great liberal theologian seminarian in Rome. And he said one day, um, Pius's personal secretary, what was his name, uh, Ronald uh, Lieber, I think it was, his personal secretary, Ronald Lieber, came to the Swiss seminarians. And they all gathered around and they wanted to know what Pius was like. And they said, is Pius a saint? Is Pius XII a saint? And Lieber said, no, he is not a saint. He is a great man of the church. And I've always thought that was a, a really, a, a great insight in the sense that uh, so much of our debate, it seems today, is about what did Pius or what did the Vatican, the attitude towards Judaism, which is so complicated and, and has such so many dark sides. But Pius was a diplomat, and it seems like so much of what he was doing in the war and then afterwards, the real framing was about the survival of the church, fighting communism, all of these other things. Do you think that's a fair, uh, a fair way to frame it? Well, no, I do think that um, he, whether he's great man of the church, certainly under, from my point of view, understanding him, you have to understand he saw his job as protecting the institutional church and defending the institutional church. And um, so in some sense, some of the more recent scandals in the church over the um, you know, sex scandals and so on have somewhat of a familiar ring in that there's this question of Pope as moral leader, as, as other kinds of ethical responsibilities versus the Pope as the head of a you know, more than billion member organization that uh, 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 he's responsible for uh, defending. And um, so uh, I, I think as we read these uh, archival materials, uh, at least what, what I've read so far, it seems to be in line with that kind of interpretation. I have to say I agree. In my uh, early modern document, there's a phrase that keeps popping up for the benefit of the church. And one thing that we have to understand that, as, as David mentions, and I think as many of uh, many people, many lay people expect the church as a religious institution to have moral authority, but it is, after all, an institution. And the church hierarchy are this institution's administrators who are responsible for the well-being of that institution. That's the prime concern, is the well-being of that institution. And that phrase that kept I kept coming up uh, you know, in my 16th, 17th, 18th century, for the benefit of the church, that was the, uh, the line. Which leads me to a question that is uh, asked, that someone asked in the audience, uh, about the archive, actually, and the, the opening of the archive. What do you make of the church's provision of the access to its archives in general? One imagines any typical private corporation's legal counsel would never allow similar access to any internal documents for fear of any kind of incrimination or bad press. Why bother at all? Is it a pragmatic choice? An ethical stance? Go ahead. Thank you. No, maybe it's um, just to remind that uh, um, the opening of the archives follow a rule. Uh, so since uh, Pope Paul, uh, mm, sorry, Leo the Thirteenth um, in eighteen eighty one, the opening of the, arch the Vatican archive follows uh, the end date of the pontificate. So until uh, two thousand twenty, um, we were able to consult the documents of um, Pius the Eleventh. Um, until it's death. So just to, and now we are able to consult the documents of uh, 12 archives, so until um, 1958, but uh, there is always the rule that we cannot consult the, the, the files um, that has documents inside uh, following that date. So there, there is a precise, uh, a very precise system of organization. And um, just to, and sometimes mm, it's difficult to be aware of this of this system, but it's, it's also interesting, and it, it's related to the way uh, the church deals with its own history. Yes, I, mean, I think uh, the point here, one of the points, is that the church is very serious about its history, very interested in its history, and uh, if you go to the Vatican, uh, the main Vatican archive. Um, 
you'll see many of the people we, we now tend to think everybody's working on World War II or on Pius XII, but in fact, uh, normally it's filled with people, you know, Polish priests working on the history of the Polish church and Brazilian clergymen working on the history of the Brazilian church. Uh, so in terms of its opening, um, you know, that's certainly an important part of it from the church point of view. Um, it's, but I, you know, I do think some credit should be given to the Vatican for opening its archive to researchers more generally, to scholars, uh, even those whose uh, own work doesn't seem to be in accord with the more kind of official narrative of, of church history. Uh, of course, uh, those of us who work there often, uh, in, you know, as we wait for the opening in the mornings, uh, sometimes chat about, you know, are there documents that somehow haven't been made available and what they would be. Remember, I once uh, met with the uh, with Bishop Pagano, the um, the head of the uh, Vatican Apostolic Archive, and asked. This was just before they were opening the archive for Pius XI, uh, so around 2006. And asked, "Are you making everything available?" And his answer to me at the time uh, was, "Yes, we're making everything available except for the more um, sensitive personnel files, which we never make available." And only later I thought about. Gee, I never saw any work on the history of the sex scandals in the church based on Vatican archives. And you know, I realized why those in fact, because there have been many investiga internal investigations of matters like that in the, uh, in the Vatican, but those files have not been, as far as I know, ever made available to scholars. So I, I have a little anecdote. I, and was it when I was doing research in the what used to be the Holy Office archive with this, uh, the Congregation for the, the Defense of, um, of Faith. Now, um, I had coffee with one of the archivists, and I asked him about the electronic access because, and it was in the midst of the sex abuse. Uh, scandal that was coming out of, uh, of America at that point, Boston, and and, and that. And I asked him about, you know, majority of it is now electronic, whether they were printing it out or how they were handling it, how they were saving it. And he only smiled and said, well, that's your problem, historians. You'll have to worry about it in, you know, in decades from now. So so there is certain consciousness about and, and that's, I think, a lesson for all of us historians that know that what the archives have doesn't mean that that's that's all the story because it takes effort to preserve and now of course with electronic it also takes effort to preserve the electronic versions that may not survive casually for centuries um uh, one thing i want to pick up on in the, the questions there are a lot of great questions from our from our audience today uh, a great audience out there um in this post-war period, which does fascinate me, is also obviously the creation of the State of Israel, uh, 1948. Is there any indication, anything new, or any indication about the Vatican's, um, you know, approach to to that topic that you've uh, found, or that uh, there have been any indications about that? Yeah, the topic is huge, and I mean. Um, um, there are plenty of new documents in the in the archives. Um, there is specifically the, in the um, uh, Vatican Apostolic Archive the file concern the collection concerning the delig apostolic delegation of Jerusalem and Palestine, which is related to the affairs also with the um, state of Israel. And there we we really see the uh, ordinary um, relationship with the new state through the um, delegation, uh, I mean, on the ground, and all the, the, the difficulties in, the, in, in this new relationship, and at the same time, um, how the local church uh, perceived and reacts to uh, the changes on the ground. Um, so it's um, the Palestinian refugees issue, um, the new institutions, so how the church, uh, the vicariates, the parishes, so really the pastoral organizations reacted to the new state. Um, so this is a, 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 these sources are completely new. And at the same time, we can find a, a part of this, uh, the, the missing correspondence. So the, the missing documents or the minutes in the, in the archives in Jerusalem, especially in the Israel State Archives or um, in the archives of the Latin Patriarchate or in the archives in the Franciscan Custody of Jerusalem. 
Um, so there, um, I'm working also on, uh, on the community establishing uh, in the early 50s um, related to Jewish converts to, to Catholicism. Um, and this is, uh, it's, it's important, this kind of history, because also it, uh, it, it prepares the Second Vatican Council. So the pontificate, it's also uh, interesting to, to open paths that we will see later. Uh, it ends before, of course, the Second Vatican Council, but concerning Israel uh, and the resistance to the new state, so the lack of formal relationship, at the same time, the new attitude of some figures concerning the new state, uh, we, we, we really have a mind in the Pius XII archives. Nina, did you want to weigh in? No, just as I um, mentioned before, um, <clears throat> what I can see is just um, resistance to um, Jewish immigration to Palestine. And so that you can uh, document now from the, from the new archives because um, an important number of these Jewish refugees were actually living from Italy. Uh, and here it's interesting because we need to cross the different archives, like the Italian National Archives, uh, archives in Jerusalem, and, um, and archives and the Vatican archives. Now, so yeah, I would say like what I can see is just confirming that the Holocaust did not alter the the Church uh, hostility toward Zionism and 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 the idea of a Jewish home in, in, in Palestine. Um, to picking up on, on uh, that issue of the Vatican vis-a-vis -vis the new emerging state of Israel, uh, it, what do you think, do you have a sense that this opening of the archives and what is coming out will have an impact on Catholic Jewish relations today? Or is this just something of the, you know, that can be shunted off to the past, but I mean, do you think there could be anything either to learn for Catholic Jewish relations today, uh, which can always be so fraught, or something that could indeed complicate them? Well, I mean, hopefully it uh, will become a matter for confronting this fraught history and in a frank way. I mean, I think it's notable that some of the national churches, I mean, the um, the French, I think, and then more recently, the German uh, bishops have released statements um, trying to confront their responsibility during the war. Uh, in the recent German case, uh, that the bishops supported the war, um, as, of course, in Italy, the uh, church supported the war as well. Uh, things that are to have been totally repressed in the Italian case, but in Germany, for example, they're now, uh, they've been coming to terms with it. So, um, what the Vatican has, has been, however, institutionally uh, unwilling to come to terms with it. And we have the 1998 report, we remember, which was uh, John uh, Paul II commissioned the Vatican Commission on Relations with the Jews to uh, study the issue of whether the church bore any responsibility for the kind of demonization of the Jews that led, could have led to the Holocaust. And after 11 years of study, uh, the report came out, uh, which the Pope himself kind of wrote the preface to, which basically denied that it did, that uh, made this distinction between anti-Judaism, which was just a kind of religious uh, matter, and which had absolutely nothing to do with the demonization of the Jews that led to the Holocaust, which was racial in nature and so forth. Um, and it's interesting, I just recently heard uh, Father Polakowski, who's a, a, a prominent uh, Catholic scholar and involved in Jewish Catholic relations, uh, saying that he had spoken with Cardinal Cassidy, who was the then the head of that commission, and, and Cardinal Cassidy's aversion of this statement was nixed by the other authorities in the Vatican, and he was not happy with the, the report because it didn't, in fact, confront the reality of this history. Uh, so one can hope that, that things will change, but I don't think it's guaranteed that uh, the institutional ch the church anytime soon uh, will confront this. And this too uh, may have to do with France, Pope, at the moment with Pope Francis' priorities that he has enough trouble with uh, certain conservative uh, portions of the church and perhaps Pius XII isn't where he wants to uh, you know, fall on his sword. Nina or Mario, any thoughts? Yes, I, I am 
I mean, I wish the opening of the archive could uh, open the door to a, a less polemical and more a more nuanced uh, debate, but um, uh, I'm actually not sure because the picture we will get from the archives, it's uh, is a mixed box and it's definitely very complex. And even in the case of rescue and uh, the Vatican aid to Jews, it's very ambivalent um, in the sense that the Jews that were worth saving for the Vatican and for the church were mostly converted. Uh, so we are, really, I mean, what I'm, I'm saying, when, for instance, with Jewish refugees, these are actually Catholics from Jewish origins. Um, and so it's very complex. And what we can see is that we are very much in a pre uh, Second Vatican Council mindset. It's, it's, we are very much before Nostra Aetate. So I think it's very difficult to find actually the roots of uh, Nostra Aetate in, in the attitude of the church uh, during that, that period. We can find some voices who are trying to, to speak out, as I said, like Mariton, uh, but they're still a minority during that time. And so the question of Jewish converts, for instance, um, it's it really um, connected to what you said before, uh, Magda, that for the church, the priority was the continuity of its apostolic mission. And so, of course, they, they tried to help Jews who were actually Catholics, because the priority was the, the church as an institution, as a, as a body. I will just say that, you know, um, that we just as we cannot it will take as david said a decade before we get any picture of what's go what was going on at the time and what the archive reveals i also think that unless the sort of social media twitter type of uh, short sentence polarization will you know break everything apart the the cha change is very slow you know, these voices that were marginal in the 30s, 40s become voices that eventually, you know, lead to Nostra Aetate. By our standard, Nostra Aetate is very unsatisfying and conservative and problematic document. But then it takes, it. what happens, the change over several decades uh, that we, we, and we see the change. I see it in the, in the classroom my uh you know fordham students are surprised uh that people believed such stuff about jews and that was that stuff was believed not too long ago uh so there there is it's very retail it's very slow and um you know we'll see i would say whether that will open things up to, you know, the church is not, even that statement, the church is not afraid of history, even though many will be afraid of history, that that phrase from the Pope may give courage to other people who may want to speak and discover and write about things that are controversial and problematic. Maria. Yes, following what Mada was saying, I think it's important to link this um, reflection also to the archives th themselves, because the history of these archives reflects this complexity. And in the same way, archives are um, not only uh, places of storage, but they act as knowledge producers in some ways. And um, that's why the importance of the historical work in um, detect all these elements and to, um, to provide new narratives to the wider audience, knowing that the changes are, are, take time. And uh, of course, and the new narratives will encounter conflicts, uh, silences, uh, expectations, uh, dilemmas. So it's, um, again, history matters and history um, takes time. And I, I know we have, to, um, we have to wrap up in, in just a couple of minutes, so I, but just to, to close it out, I mean, to, to pivot in a sense away from just the, the church per se, uh, I have to ask you all, what, you know, yeah, we're talking about history, but look at what's happening today. I mean, what is your sense as you're in there reading these primary documents from the 30s and the 1940s, and then you go out and you read Twitter or, or, or 
or the newspapers today with um, these kind of, you know, populisms and fascisms and anti-Semitisms on the rise. Can I just get a personal you know, sense from each of you of what it's like to be in these archives and then see what is happening around us today? Well, um, you know, certainly those uh, speaking as uh, an American and looking at the relationship of uh, major religious institutions to um, the American political scene over the last uh, half dozen years, uh, and then studying the uh, Vatican and its relationship with, especially with the Italian fascist regime, I believe uh, Nazi regime, which is a totally different case, which I think many people don't seem to appreciate that the, the Vatican's attitude toward the Italian fascist regime is totally different than its attitude toward the Nazi regime. Um, you know, you, you see, uh, I think you see a lot of similarities. That is that religious leaders um, seeing in the uh, political uh, personage that they're going to back, you know, not a religious bone in their body, uh, someone who would never voluntarily walk into a church, um, but favoring them over others who may be uh, deeply religious. I mean, I think uh, uh, I'm friendly with Romano Prodi in, in Italy, uh, who was you know, the center left uh, prime minister a couple of times, and he was never backed by the Vatican, then always backed Berlusconi, who, of course, uh, and Prodi has never missed a ma Sunday mass in his entire life. If Berlusconi has ever been in church, uh, you know, other than for a photo op, it's uh, unclear. So, uh, you know, in terms of being in the archives, reading particularly uh, the period of uh, during fascism uh, and thinking about the American political scene, uh, one sees, I think, a lot of um, similarities uh, or at least parallels. Yes, that, that's not an easy question to <laughs> conclude. Uh, but I would say, I mean, it's, uh, it's fascinating to uh, re research in the archives and to see the forging of prejudices and, and stereotypes. And you, you can see that through different documents in different versions, in different uh, sensibilities, I would say. Uh, but to be confronted with that, the fabric of uh, stereotypes and prejudices, and and, and uh, so it's 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 very fascinating, but it's also of course um, frightening to confront that with with today with the current situation. But I must say, the opening itself of the archives of the archives, sorry, it's um, makes me more hopeful and, and optimistic because it's access to knowledge, it's access to, it gives us actually historian and research, researchers a, a, chance, a chance to um, to show that this history is very complex and to give more than a, just a black and white answer. So actually I think the opening of the archives is an important step toward knowledge and, and education and that uh, it's connected to what you said Magda before about <laughs> teaching, uh, at Fordham, and I, as I was teaching a class on anti-Semitism at, at Fordham, I found that that make, makes me feel like optimistic about the future, I must say. Maria. Yes, I, I, th uh, I agree. And um, I think it, um, also this opening um, and the similarities frightening that you were seeing um, between the world we live in now and uh, what we, the world that we find in the documents we read um, reminds us also the importance of the opening of the archives, not only for the scholars, because uh, this kind of, because archives uh, matter also for non-academic and the wider public. And uh, it, this is particularly true uh, for these documents that concern a period of time, so from 1939 to 1958, that still it's so largely debated and uh, that has also persistent consequences on our today's world. And uh, of course, this is particularly evident for uh, Jewish Catholic relations. So uh, it's time to wrap up and I wanna thank all of you for being here. Uh, the audience and you, um, David and Maria Chiara, and Nina and David Gibson too. Uh, this was a wonderful session that really sort of encapsulates the mission of what we do here at Fordham in general and also at, in, at the Center for Jewish Studies at Fordham 
and in our classes is to to bring to fore and discuss uh, sometimes difficult questions uh, and to hopefully you know what as Nina say make us feel a little bit uh, more optimistic even though in this very difficult time. So I want to again thank you for joining us today and throughout the year and I want to invite you to uh, continue to come to our programs next year. We have a, a whole slate of wonderful, challenging and, uh, and interesting programs that will open up all kinds of um, questions that we are thinking about uh, and, uh, and uh, join our ma mailing list. And we will also make recommendations for summer readings and, and uh, films that you could watch. Uh, while we are not keeping you busy. So again, my gratitude to David Kurtzer, to Maria Chiarioli, to Nina Valbusque and David Gibson and all of you uh, for coming and for your support and generosity. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>